Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to the uh, welcome to the orientation program um, uh, on 14 December. Today we'll be having uh, uh, a very uh, uh, not just a formal uh, interaction with you, but also a very detailed uh, orientation with you. Uh, so we have two deans amongst us. We have uh, Dean uh, uh, Professor Sujata Sengar, who's Dean Academics. And we have uh, Professor Vijinder Singh, who is Dean Student Welfare with us. So today you will be having a session on uh, the various academic activities that are happening in the university. And whatever your questions are, whatever your, uh, uh, you know, uh, you, the pieces of advice you have for us, that will all be discussed in this session. And uh, apart from that, we will be having an expert session, which will be right after uh, the orientation program, which will be chaired by Professor Suzata Sengar. And meanwhile, we will all be here for any other uh, queries and assistance that is required. So at 3.30, we'll be having our expert session by Mr. Naveen Jhakar on uh, cyber etiquettes. So now I would uh, go to Professor Tudata Sengar. Uh, Ma'am, you can please begin. <coughs> okay. Uh, so dear parents and uh, students, uh, a very good afternoon to all of you. And good afternoon to all my colleagues who have uh, joined me for this session. Um, uh, so, I spoke to you in the on the first day also. I am Professor Sujata Sengar, Dean of Academics, and basically I am from the Department of Electronics and Communication. <coughs> so, we became a university in 2018, and since then, uh, we have been uh, continuously working on improving the academic system based upon our experiences of the past uh, system and on the feedbacks received from our students and from our alumni. <clears throat> Basically, uh, our approach is that uh, we are emphasizing on the overall scheme and the scheme that we have adopted is the choice-based credit system, which to a large extent we do say it's student-centric. Of course, it is student-centric if uh, students understand the system and students uh, exercise their choices in the proper way. If uh, they are not uh, aware of the right way of exercising their choices, then probably they will not be able to uh, gain uh, most of the benefit from this scheme. Um, the second thing that we are working very hard on is the curriculum because there had been a long standing uh, uh, complaint or grievance that there is no revision in the curriculum. And the approach that we are following is that we are designing the curriculum as the semester comes, right? So uh, we uh, we are currently going into the fourth semester of our BTEC program. So, I'm meeting my We are uh, going through our uh, fourth semester. So we have just finished with the preparation of the fourth semester curriculum. Uh, by the end of the fourth semester, we will be ready with our plan for the fifth semester and so on and so forth. So the entire curriculum is not ready. We are doing it step by step so that we can bring in the best possible for our students and we can bring in the best possible electives in the most structured way so that our students can have maximum benefit and we are able to <coughs> we are able to make them ready for for the industry research whatever they want to do so that is our uh, basically our objective <coughs> so our our aim at nsut here is to prepare the students uh, in the best possible way so that they are ready to face up the challenges in life and they are ready to embrace whatever is their choice. Either they want to go in for uh, management-based jobs or they want to go in for research-oriented work or they want to go for uh, higher studies or they want to go in for entrepreneurship. Uh, whatever it is, we would like to accommodate all students and we would like to accommodate all choices and we would like to group all possible uh, <coughs> fields of interest of the student. So this is basically possible only if we um, 
embrace what is known as the choice based credit system. Uh, so, if you allow me, can I present my screen? Asta? Yes, ma'am, you can present it. Okay, so because I've made a small PPT for the students, I'll present the screen to yes, so that they from your side itself. understand the scheme. So, uh, I'm going to talk about the entire academic program. Uh, at some places, I might appear a bit hard on my words, but those are not my words. Those are the words that are given in the academic, academic rules and regulations, which are formulated by an august body of the university, which is known as the Senate which comprises of large number of academicians from all over India. So they, I'm speaking those words, but the words are of the academic rules and regulations. The second thing is that my presentation here is basically focused on the BTEC program. Similar things exist for the BBA program also. Similar things exist for the Bachelor of Fashion Technology program also. Any specific understanding for that, we will request our Dean of fact, uh, Management Studies and our Dean of uh, Design to <coughs> explain that uh, uh, academic rules in detail. I would further uh, request all parents and all students to refer to this document, which is available on our website under academic rules or academic uh, <coughs> matters. It is very well on the website. You have to go to it thoroughly so that you understand what is going to come in future. So that is it. <clears throat> now, as I have just said, uh, we have adopted the choice based credit system in 2016. We adopted the system and we already have four years of experience of the system. And based upon our experience, we have tried to iron out all the lacuna in the system and come up with what we call our NSUT CBCS system. So <clears throat> what is basically, why do we emphasize on CBCS? Why are we so uh, enthusiastic about CBCS? The most, most importantly, the curriculum is interdisciplinary. It makes it interdisciplinary in the sense that it allows the students to <clears throat> take up uh, courses from large number of disciplines and we have uh, our system of uh, allotting courses and our timetable system is uh, so flexible that students can actually choose a wide variety of courses so <clears throat> that makes uh, makes it possible for the curriculum to become interdisciplinary uh, that is what is meant by the cafeteria approach in which the students can choose courses of their own choice now here, when we say choose courses of their own choice, <clears throat> I have a word of caution over here. The way you have to choose your um, courses has to be planned well in advance because <clears throat> you have to decide or you have to understand what is your aim. It's a flexible system, so it requires a lot of responsibility and a lot of maturity at your end. And of course, we are there to help you to understand how to make your choices, provided the students attend the <coughs> orientation programs that we hold for them regularly, at least one program a semester. Not only that, each department has an academic officer and students can take their guidelines also. Now, why I'm saying it is that you have to be <coughs> responsible as that. If you want to take a particular course X in the seventh semester, then you have to start planning to take their prerequisites in the previous semesters so that in the seventh semester, you can opt for a particular course. If you do not do this planning in the systematic way, maybe in spite of all the flexibility that we allow you, 
you may not be able to do the course of your choice. If required, and a thorough uh, <coughs> presentation on, on uh, this is required, we will definitely do that. That depends upon how the students approach me, and we will definitely do that. Now, <coughs> there uh, we give additional avenues of learning beyond the core courses. This is more or less the same as what we have set in the cafeteria approach. Some courses are mandatorily uh, have to be studied and some are of your uh, choice. So you can cho choose beyond those core courses and so you can uh, explore other avenues also. Now, the, <coughs> the most is that students can learn at their own pace. I will explain this a little later. Uh, I mean, for each semester, there are a minimum number of credits and a maximum number of credits. So depending upon your plans, what you are planning to do, what are you planning to join some uh, coaching for a gate exam or are you planning for uh, taking your GRE exam or you are planning uh, to uh, set up a startup or whatever it is, based upon this, you can take fewer credits in some semesters and larger number of credits in other semesters. But once again, you should have a plan in hand. What are you planning to do? So I will talk about it in the next <coughs> few slides. Now, uh, we say that it promotes a holistic and overall development of the student. Uh, uh, that is basically since we allow a large number of electives which are not engineering oriented, but which have orientation towards uh, humanities, social sciences, and management. And so uh, <coughs> uh, students can choose those courses and that will give an overall development of the student. In addition to that, we have some more courses uh, which are non-engineering in nature. And so their basic objective is for our overall development. I'll talk about a little more about this as we go ahead. So the salient features of our uh, academic program is the wide range of courses, as I have just said, the credit system, the comprehensive and continuous assessment that the student is assessed continuously throughout the semester. The evaluation is based upon relative grading. That is, you are evaluated or graded rather not evaluated, but graded on the basis of your performance relative to your class. Not an absolute performance, but your performance relative to your own class. I will talk a little more detail about this later. <coughs> now, uh, I think I'll skip this slide because uh, I've said a lot about this. And let us go on to the structure. So this entire course uh, program that you will go through in these four years, we basically offer <coughs> three types of courses. The first category of courses is the core courses, and they have a code CC. Now, these courses are the courses that are to be compulsorily studied by a student as a core requirement to complete the requirement of the program. So you will have a set of core courses for say electronics and communication. You will have a set of core courses for CSAI. You will have a set of core courses for mechanical engineering. You cannot do away with them. Those have to be mandatory study. Then next comes the elective courses. These are the courses where the student can exercise his or her choice. Now, electives are also fall under three categories. <clears throat> they are the discipline-centric electives. What are those discipline-centric electives? They add proficiency to the student in a particular discipline. For example, if you are a student of mechanical engineering, then these electives, discipline-centric electives, are meant to add more proficiency to your knowledge of mechanical engineering. Now, <clears throat> what is different? You might be interested in electrical vehicles, so you can choose those uh, electives from the stream of electrical vehicles. 
You might be interested in robotics, so you might choose all the electives from the area of robotics and add proficiency to your knowledge of mechanical engineering. The second category of courses is the generic electives. <clears throat> and these are actually meant for generic proficiency and interdisciplinary pers perspective of students. For example, a student of electrical engineering might be interested in studying about electrical vehicles of the mechanical engineering department, then the student is allowed to opt for a course of a different department as his or her elective. The generic electives are basically <coughs> courses which are core courses for other departments which a student of a particular department may like to opt for. So, an electronics and communication engineering student can opt for courses from the mechanical department. ECE student may opt for courses of the computer department. <coughs> computer students may opt for courses of the biotechnology department and so on and so forth. And our timetable design is so flexible that students can actually opt for a wide variety of courses. Now, the third uh, category of uh, courses are your open electives. And these uh, electives are uh, the courses that can be taken from a common pool of non-engineering disciplines. And they are basically meant for uh, broadening the perspective of engineering students. And these courses basically fall under two groups. Open electives from the humanities and social sciences group humanities, social sciences, and management group, and open electives from the sciences group. So <clears throat> these courses you can take from uh, fifth semester onwards. So you might be interested in economics, you might be interested in financial management, you might be interested in say, some uh, linear algebra, you might be interested in group theory of mathematics, and so on and so forth. So these sort of courses are offered in the open elective stream. So all in all, go uh, core courses pahne hai sare. Then you can study some discipline centric courses, some generic electives which are courses of other departments, and some open electives which are common to the entire university, which follow under the category of humanities and social sciences and management. That is one group and the <coughs> group of sciences is the other. Now, in addition to that, we have the courses which are known as the foundation courses, which you are currently studying in the first semester, or you will start from 21st onwards. Now, these foundation courses, they are basically um, courses that are required uh, for <coughs> Uh, fundamental knowledge enhancement, and they are mandatory for all disciplines. So foundation, compulsory foundation courses, they are courses from sciences, humanities, social sciences, and basic engineering, and they are mandatory for all disciplines, right? I will come to what these courses are in the next few slides. In addition to that, we have something which is known as foundation electives. And these are basically non-engineering courses, and they are uh, basically meant for uh, value-based education. And uh, all of you who have joined the university must have been allotted a foundation elective course. Now, uh, throughout the entire uh, four years, a student has to study three foundation elective courses. And these courses, they do not carry any credits. But it is mandatory to pass <coughs> these courses uh, in order to be eligible for the award of degree. There is a long list of courses, but uh, unfortunately, due to the COVID scenario, and since we are online, so we have not been able to offer students electives of uh, the sports uh, category. So we have uh, sports, yoga, dance, music, um, 
and uh, theater and many other courses which we have not been able to offer in this semester because of the pandemic and uh, let us all pray that the pandemic goes away and uh, in the second semester there is no foundation elective but in the third semester <clears throat> again that is august uh, 2 2021 if everything is fine, you can enjoy the sports ground, you can do theater, you can do music, yoga, and many other things. So <clears throat> these are the courses that fall under the category of foundation elective. Yeh dhyan rahe, parents, bachche. Foundation elective, aapko teen foundation elective pass karna anivare hai. If you do not pass these three courses, you will not be awarded a degree. This is very, very important to understand. Uh, now let us look at the, uh, the first, uh, I've initially introduced you to the type of courses. So if we summarize, there have first year mein aap aate hai foundation core, a compulsory foundation and foundation electives. Uske baad, Aapke second semester onwards, you will have core courses. And then from fifth semester onwards, you will have core courses plus elective courses. In elective courses, you have three types of electives. Discipline-centric electives, which belong to your area of study or your discipline of uh, the BTEC program. Generic electives, which are courses from other departments. And open electives, which are non-engineering courses from humanities, management, and sciences. <clears throat> so that is the overall framework of the type of courses that the student can take. Now let us look at the program duration and structure. So <clears throat> the most important thing is that before the start of the semester, as per the academic calendar, unfortunately, we have not been able to release a formal academic calendar this year because everything is so uh, fuzzy right now. Nothing is clear. COVID ke karan kya situation hoga? Online chalenge, offline hi rahega. As of now, we are going online. But based upon the instructions of the government from time to time, uh, academic schedules might change. So we have not been able to release a very elaborate academic calendar, which we used to do. <clears throat> so before the beginning of a semester, a student has to register for a requisite number of courses. If a student does not register, then it is assumed that a student is not studying in that semester. So registration is mandatory. Registration is essential. Parents, this is for you. Students, it is very important. If you do not register, you will not be allowed to take a mid-semester exam. You will not be allowed to take an end-semester exam. You will not be evaluated because our university management system, which we call CUMS, will have a record of all students who have registered at the beginning of a semester. So registration is a very, very important thing. And we release a detailed schedule for registration for all students. First semester, it is done automatically. It does, it's not much of you to bother about. But second semester onwards, you have to be very particular that you have registered. It is not done automatically. There are certain terms and conditions for you to register for a semester. <clears throat> right now the second important point is that there are a certain uh, in each semester there are a certain minimum number of credits if you don't understand credits then you you may say courses that you have to register and you cannot register beyond a maximum number of credits that is if for a particular semester the minimum credit courses is four and the maximum courses is seven, then you cannot take less than four courses and you will not be allowed to take more than seven courses. <clears throat> so that is what it means by the minimum number of credits. 
Another important thing is that the minimum duration of the program is four years and the maximum span is seven years. You have to finish everything within seven years. Now, uh, this is the semester-wise uh, course of the credit distribution. This is a little, I mean, it might appear very cumbersome for you to understand at this stage, but a little understanding will not be out of place. So you are here in the first semester right now. If we look at the types of courses that we have, then you have to take one non-credit course, which is a foundation elective. All those of you who have joined and who have been allotted a board number, I'm sure all of you must have been uh, assigned a foundation elective courses course. And in fact, your classes are also going on. In addition to that, a student, <coughs> every student has to study five foundation courses. The category is five foundation course. So aapko first semester mein paanch foundation course karne padenge. There are no core courses, no electives, no training project. This makes it six courses where one course is a non-credit course, five courses of four credits each. So that makes it 20 credits. Now if I try to explain the next semester, second semester there is no foundation elective. There are three foundation core courses and three department core courses. Matla second semester onwards, aapke apne department ke courses aana shuru ho jayenge. You start studying courses of your own department. <laughs> now, if we look at it, again, it is six courses and all of four credits. So this makes it 24 credits. If I say go to the fifth semester, suppose, then there is no foundation elective, there is no foundation core. You have four core courses, and then you can choose between department elective and other electives. The maximum number of, minimum number of courses that you have to mandatorily study are four, and the maximum that you can study are seven, meaning thereby that, you can choose to study between four to seven courses. Now, here is what I want to explain and make you understand. Suppose, suppose there is a student who is going to prepare for some examination, which will be held somewhere in, say, the seventh semester. Aap seventh semester ke dauraan koi aapka exam hai, GRE hai, GATE hai, vagera vagera, jo bhi aap kar rahi hai. Agar ho aapko seventh mein karna hai, and you feel that you would like to take lesser load in the sixth semester, and you will want to focus more on your competitive exam that is to come, for example, CAT, GATE or whatever it is, then you are free to study only three courses minimum. But since you have only studied three courses here, you will have to take either more courses in the fifth semester or you will have to take more courses in the in the uh, seventh and in the eighth semester. So that depends upon you. There is a flexibility after the fifth semester. Fifth to eighth, there is a flexibility. Maan lije koi bachcha aisa hai, koi student aisa hai, jo seventh semester mein kahi internship karna chahata hai. He doesn't want to take any course here in the university. He wants to go to some industry or wants to go to some foreign university for a uh, one semester or whatever the student wishes to do. Then the student is free to take zero courses here. But of course, project and training he has to take for six credits. You may not register for any theory course except for project. But in order that you maintain your total credit count to 170, you may register for more courses in the fifth and sixth semester. 
register for minimum courses in the seventh semester and register for large number of courses in the eighth semester. That way your seventh semester is least loaded. So, you plan karna hai ki aapke kaun sa semester ko aapko minimum loading chahiye. Aap usme credits kam le sakte hai, baki semesters mein aap credits jyada le sakte hai. Iske liye aapko planning karni pade. Is liye, iske liye aapko first semester se leke fourth semester mein achhi tarah samaj lena hai ki aapka bhavishya ka direction kya hai. Aapko kaun sa imtahan karna hai. आपको क्या कोई स्टार्टअप इनिशिएट करना है तो उस स्टार्टअप में आपको कहां समय ज्यादा देना है किस सेमेस्टर में आप समय ज्यादा देना चाहते हैं तो यहां कम पढ़ना चाहते हैं अकॉर्डिंगली उस सेमेस्टर में आप कम क्रेडिट्स लें मिनिमम ले लें और अदर सेमेस्टर्स में आप मैक्सिमम क्रेडिट्स ले लें आप किसी फॉरेन यूनिवर्सिटी में इंटर्नशिप के लिए जाना चाहते हैं एक पूरे सेमेस्टर के लिए एर्थ में तो आप अपने सारे क्रेडिट काउंट सेवेंथ तक पूरा कर लें एर्थ में आप फ्री हैं आप प्रोजेक्ट और ट्रेनिंग का आप अपना डिपार्टमेंट से परमिशन लीजिए और अकॉर्डिंगली आपका अरेंजमेंट किया जाएगा आपने सेवेंथ सेमेस्टर में कुछ अरेंजमेंट कर लिया है ट्रेनिंग का तो आप सेवेंथ में मिनिमम लीजिए पर उन क्रेडिट्स को मेकअप करने के लिए आपको फिफ्थ सिक्स और एर्थ में ज्यादा क्रेडिट्स लेने पड़ेगा so this is what is known as learning at your own pace you can learn faster in some semesters you can learn slower in other semesters if you are something that you said that no i want to pass all my courses at an average rate then you can take <coughs> um, average number of courses in each semester and pass your course uh, program in eight semesters so all that depends upon what you have planned for yourself, what you have understood, what you want to do. Or aisa nahi hai ko uske liye aapke paas samay nahi hai. You have a lot of time from the first semester to the fourth semester to decide what your future, what future planning is required. Accordingly, you can plan your credit requirements to from fifth semester to fourth semester. If we had been uh, meeting offline one-to-one -one, then uh, if you had any direct queries i would have uh, answered them but still if you have some queries i will collect them and then i will post the answers for you <clears throat> so the total number of credits that you need to earn are 84 credits in the fourth semester first half first two years and in the next two years there are 86 credits that is what you have the pattern for the 84 credits is fixed 20 24 20 and 20 and the pattern for the 86 credits in the third and fourth year are variable it is for you to decide how many credits you want to take when and where now <clears throat> since you are in the first semester so this is the structure for the first semester course the courses that you are taking uh, is these are known as the foundation core courses and these foundation core courses are mandatory for all uh, programs and all disciplines are all branches and it is mathematics is one course the other core course is computer programming oblique english so some of you must be studying computer programming and some of you must be allotted English. Then there is another course which is known as electrical and electronics engineering, which is mandatory for all students and all of you must have been allotted this course. Now, if you look at this course, the mathematics course falls under the category of basic sciences. Computer programming falls under the category of engineering sciences. And English falls under the categories of humanities and social sciences. So, ye jo aapke foundation core courses hai, isme aapke sare courses ki uh, variety hai, uh, more or less in equal weightage. Then the other course that you must be studying is either physics or environment science and green chemistry. Those who have studied physics in this semester, in the second semester you will study chemistry. 
And the ones who are studying chemistry in this semester, the next semester you will be studying physics. Both of them are of the basic sciences category. Then there is one course on basics of mechanical engineering, which is mandatory for all students. And all of you must have been allotted this course. The last course is the foundation elective course, which if you look over here is a mandatory course. There are no credits for this, but it is mandatory to pass this course. Now in this table is the evaluation scheme, which we'll be talking about a little more in detail. So mathematics course doesn't have a lab. So the theory part has continuous assessment, 25 marks, mid semester 25 marks, end semester 50 marks. As a he, aapka computer programming and English has a practical component. So theory and practical, accordingly you have uh, this uh, distribution of marks. <clears throat> so this is the scheme for the first semester. And for the second semester also there is a table like this. And as I said right in the beginning, this table is being generated every semester for the next uh, semester. So we have just finished this work for the fourth semester. During fourth semester, we will prepare the scheme of courses for the fifth semester so that we are able to bring in the latest developments of in technology into your curriculum. So this is what we are uh, trying to do for our students. Uh, <clears throat> now, uh, comprehensive and continuous assessment is one of the key features of uh, the CBCS scheme. And I think you already have an idea about it, but still let us have a look at this. So foundation courses, there is no end semester exam. It's continuous assessment only of 100 marks. It's not any formal mid-semester, excuse me. There will be no formal mid-semester exam or end semester exam, uh, but you will be assessed continuously <coughs> for this course. Now we have courses which have theory and tutorial. For this continuous assessment, which will be based, I will show in the next slide how it is done. You have a mid-semester exam, which is a theory exam, which will be worth of 25 marks, and an end-semester exam, which will be of uh, 50 marks. Similarly, you have uh, courses which have theory and practical. Uh, mind you, one thing that is to be very, very clear over here is that practical courses are not separate courses. They are part of the course itself. So you have theory plus practical type of course or theory plus tutorial type of course. So here the <coughs> theory assessment is 15 marks. Mid semester for theory is 15 marks. End semester theory is 40 marks. And continuous assessment for practical is 15 marks and end semester for practical is 15 months. So this is the evaluation scheme for various courses. Currently, you must be only bothered about FE and FSC type of courses. So this is the distribution of marks. Now, here I would like to say something. Agar aap isko bahut dhyan se dekhe, uh, please excuse me for using Hindi in between. If you look at this very carefully, you have 25 marks which is for continuous assessment. Thoda thoda padhiye, thoda thoda imtahan ho jayega. There is no problem at all in scoring good in these 25 marks. Mid semester exam, it is held in the middle of the semester for half of the syllabus. You can very well score good here. Then you have end semester exam, which is an exam based on the entire semester. This is which will have a little in the course. So if you keep on working, studying regularly, putting in moderate efforts on regular basis, I don't find any reason why you should have any difficulty in the course. But if it suddenly dawns upon you one day before the mid semester that you have to take an exam, then take my words, life is difficult. If suddenly two days before the end semester exam, it dawns upon you, you, you suddenly realize that, oh, I have to take an exam, then life is difficult. But if you are studying on continuous basis, I would say that it is rather easy to earn marks. 
but you have to be a regular. And needless to say, this everyone knows, but somehow <laughs> after this uh, long pressure of G, et cetera, is re released, students are in a state of euphoria and they forget that. I will request our mothers to ensure that students don't forget that engineering may be padhna padta hai aur ye NSUT hai NSUT mein ink academics pe kaafi focus hai sab cheezon pe focus hai iska arth ye nahi hai ki academics pe focus nahi hai sab cheezon pe focus hai aur academics par to focus hai hi hai so mothers that is where we require your help try to see that uh, in their state of uh, ecstasy that we have got into a world class university there is no need to study it's not like that they have to do it and a little effort every day will pay the uh, will pay the and you will be able to sail through the course very easily but at the last moment you say that you hook up things and go and take your exam and all that then it becomes difficult <laughs> Now, uh, the continuous assessment part, if you look at the previous slide, uh, the continuous assessment part has a significant weightage, 25% here and 15 marks here and 15 marks here, that is 30% marks here, so that is a significant weightage. So, <clears throat> this table might not appear to be very, very, very relevant uh, in this semester because of the unusual circumstances, but more or less this is what is followed. Continuous assessment is done on the basis of two mandatory class tests, assignments, teacher's assessment based upon surprise quizzes, viva voci, class attendance, etc., etc. And theory with practical, which have a practical component, you have one mandatory class test, one mandatory lab test, assignments, projects, etc. So if I go back, you have one mid-semester exam, you have one end semester theory exam, you have one end semester practical exam. These are three exams here. And then you have two class tests here. So you have to take at least five assessments per semester. And these number of assessments have been increased due to the COVID pandemic, so that we have regular assessments because of the online scenario. So the assessment uh, mechanism is a slightly different during this uh, COVID situation. But I'm sure by the time uh, this first semester is over, we will be able to get rid of COVID and we will come back to our normal <coughs> scheme of uh, evaluation. And this is the normal scheme of evaluation. So even a normal assessment, a student has to take five assessments for each subject. In addition to that, the teacher may assign give you assignments. The teacher may give you quizzes. The teacher may give you uh, projects. The teacher may give you uh, uh, take a viva or and so on. So, so that is what it means continuous assessments. Minimum five assessments in a semester. And if you work persistently at a moderate pace, there is no reason why you should have any difficulty in any one of the courses. But if you sleep and suddenly you get a one morning and walk up for the test, definitely there's a difficulty. <clears throat> now we have talked about the type of courses. We have talked about the assessment and uh, let me talk about the grading. Uh, uh, Asa, do I have uh, enough time? How much time do I have? Yes, ma'am, you have time. Okay. We have about 40 minutes on us. That's not okay. So uh, now grading. Uh, grading is uh, uh, is uh, um, relative grading uh, in our university. We have adopted relative grading. 
And the letter grades that are assigned to the student are as follows. You have O grade, A plus A, and so on and so forth. And then the grades below serial number eight, these are, uh, uh, I pray that no student ever sees these grades. These are the grades where I should have marked them red rather. So fail, fail due to detention because you didn't come to the university, fail because you were absent, and withdrawal because you withdrew from the course. So all these, uh, if you get an O grade, you are given a grade point of 10, and so on and so forth. So this is, I think, quite standard. Uh, even in your schools, you must have come across this. <coughs> what is different is, uh, is the relative grading. So uh, we have implemented relative grading for uh, awarding grades and CGPA and SGPA in the CBS system. It's a 10 point grading system, just as we have seen. Semester grade point average is computed uh, for a current semester and uh, cumulative grade point average is computed uh, for all completed semesters. And finally, when you pass out, you will be given a CGPA. There are some uh, guidelines for allotting the CGPA, which we will, I might not talk in very much detail here, but uh, there are some guidelines for that also. <clears throat> now, uh, this is something which uh, appears to be a little uh, uh, tedious, but uh, <clears throat> it is actually tedious to understand. Here, uh, the marks of a student are normalized and a normalized score is calculated. And the normalized score is as follows. So, uh, a student who has scored average marks, uska normalized score zero aega. And a student who has scored very high marks will have a normalized score of 1.5. And one who has scored very poor will have a normalized score of minus 1.5. So an average student is allotted a B plus grade and a B plus if you look here, B plus a seven. So we expect average students to get a CGPA of uh, 6.5 to seven is a CGPA for an average student. If a student gets an O grade in all the courses, then he gets a grade point of 10. So such a student is an outstanding student. And if a student is allotted a, a pass grade, then you get a CGPA of four, which is obviously a very poor grade. So B plus is good, and that is allotted to an average student. Now, what does this relative grading mean? Or what does this normalized score mean? Normalized score is based upon the statistics of the marks of uh, a particular class. So, if in a particular course, the average score is 70%, then 70% 70 student will be given a B plus grade, right? And that becomes a seven CGP. If the average in a particular class is 78, then 78 marks a student will be given a grade of B plus, which is equivalent to seven point. So uh, uh, practice, effectively speaking, your uh, score has been lowered. If the average score of a class is 50, uh, is say uh, 60 marks, then you get a B plus for 60 marks, which is equivalent to seven. So that becomes seven. So your score has been upgraded. So these grades that you get is relative. That will depend upon the average of the class score and the standard deviation of the class score. I will not go into the technicalities, but that will depend upon how the class performed as a whole. Now here, <clears throat> um, on the very first day to talk about something to the parents and students of this nature doesn't look nice, 
But uh, I think uh, as a teacher, I should I should definitely talk about it. Look, in this online mode, we have been left with no option but online assessments. And our experience has said that students resort to unethical means in the online mode. It is a little difficult to adopt unethical means in the offline mode. And those who do uh, get involved in them, unethical means, they are a lot of uh, uh, <coughs> examination section has unfair means, etc. rules to tackle those students. But you get involved in unethical means and you share answers and uh, good students in the class are, are very concerned about their friends and they share the answers and what will happen? Ultimately, what is going to happen is that the average of the class is going to go up. So unethical means, ko, fair means, ko apanate hue, agar class ka average 60 tha, to 60 marks wale ko B plus mil gaya. Uh, B plus ka grade point hai 77. Also, jab aap marks ko convert karenge, that becomes 70 marks. Ab aapne unethical means apanaye, the average of the class becomes 72, or say 75. Then, B plus is awarded for 75, and your marks, which were 75, is translated to a grade point of 7. So, effectively, your marks have been brought down to 70. So, if you help your friends, actually, what are you doing? You are increasing the class average. And you are where you were because you helped your friends. You didn't take help. So, you have class ka average and you have your grade. Diya. So, unethical means is a joint behavior of a class. And it is the students who have to bear the fruits or the brunt of this joint behavior. And it will reflect in your own grades. If your entire class scores very high, accordingly, the average goes up and accordingly, the grades will change. If the class average is low, accordingly, the mean goes low and you get a B grade for a lower score. You apply unethical means, all of you share answers, class average goes up and B plus will be allotted for 76 marks. So it becomes useless except that you have wasted your time and you have been dishonest for a little while and somewhere or the other it will prick you that you became dishonest for some time. No point in becoming dishonest because you are hurting yourself as a whole. <clears throat> so that's a relative grade. Now let us come to some, these are uh, some uh, points which will not be very clearly understood by students. Parents can have a look at it. The only gist of this slide is the reason why I brought it over here is that there is no passing marks in relative grade. Aisa bachcha na soche ke pass marks ye hote hain. The passing score will depend upon the class performance. And there is no fixed marks to uh, score an O grade. And O grade will also depend upon the class performance. But yes, there are certain writers. Howsoever bad the class performance is, if a student does not score 30%, then the student fails. That is one thing. On the other hand, howsoever good the class performance may be, a student can never fail if a student scores 40%. If a school student course scores more than 40%, so the, the uh, passing marks will lie somewhere between 30 to 40. That will depend upon the performance of the entire class in this course. For a particular course, the passing marks might be 30. For another course, the passing marks might be 41. And they can range anywhere between 30 to 40 percent. That depends upon the <coughs> performance of the class. If the class score is very high, some logo ne 
कोलैबोरेटिव एग्जाम दिया तो 40 परसेंट वाला भी फेल हो जाएगा 41 पे पास होगा सबने अपना अपना काम किया पर नंबर थोड़े कम आए उस केस में फेल ग्रेड बाउंड्री विल बिकम 30 परसेंट सिमिलरली फॉर ओ ग्रेड इट से हाउ सो एवर वट सो एवर विद सिचुएशन इफ यू हैव स्कोर लेस देन एटी फाइव परसेंट यू कैन नेवर बी गिवेन एन ओ ग्रेड बट If you score more than ninety-five percent, then you will definitely be given an O grade, irrespective of the behavior of the class. So the O grade also varies between eighty-five to ninety-five. मैं फिर कह रही हूँ सब ने collaborate किया तो O grade का boundary ninety-five पहुँच गया. You will get a O grade only if you score ninety-six percent. Everyone did his or her work. Paper was a little tough. You didn't score that high. In that scenario, a O grade might be awarded even at 85 percent. So, try to understand this. Help yourself. Help others in the right way ethically. But unethical means is never helping. It is creating problems for yourself also. And this is what I've tried to explain. Now, to summarize, passing score. Uh, i mean fail fail boundary can be anywhere between 30 to 40 o grade boundary can be anywhere between 85 to 95 other grade boundaries will depend upon the upper boundary and the lower boundary i might not be very clear because the students are not aware of this but one thing that should be clear is that if the class average is not very good then the student can pass at 30% if the class average is very high then a student scoring 40% can also fail if the class average is not very good then you might be awarded an o grade at 85% if the class average is very high then you might not be awarded an o grade even at 95% that is the crux of this Uh, relative grading scheme the grades and the corresponding marks depend upon the relative performance of the student with respect to the class you collaborate with each other you are doing nothing but increasing the boundaries and making it more difficult to achieve a particular grade <clears throat> i i hope i've tried to explain this uh now the most difficult part Uh, that is the attendance and the detention rooms. Well, uh, one thing that I need to draw your attention is that minimum requirement of attendance is seventy five percent of the total number of classes held till mid semester and end semester exam. In order to be eligible to appear for mid sem and end sem in a subject. So if you have not attended seventy five percent classes, till mid sem you will not be allowed to appear for mid sem. <clears throat> Now that is not Sujata Singer's uh, verdict. This is what is said in our rule book. I am only implementing those rules, and I am happy to do that. And end semester exam तक अगर आपके पिचत्तर percent attendance नहीं हुई, then you will be debarred from end semester. Now, minimum attendance is seventy-five percent. Doesn't mean that a student should always be hovering on the boundary of seventy-five. That you miss one class and you become seventy-four, and then you you, uh, you spent at the time which you should have spent on studying for your exams, running to offices to claim a relaxation in the marks because next class is the dean academics can allow a relaxation. And you will come up with all sorts of certificates saying that I was ill, etc., etc. Remember, seventy-five percent is the minimum. It means that you have already been given a twenty-five percent allowance for illness, family issues, other issues, fun and frolic, whatever you want to do. Our semester runs for teaching runs for thirteen weeks. That is a thumb rule. And seventy twenty five percent of thirteen weeks comes out to be around one fourth. 
So one fourth of 13 weeks is what? Um, some, a little more than three weeks. So in one full semester, you can fall ill for three weeks. You can attend to your family issues for three weeks. You may go for a, uh, uh, outing for three weeks, no problem. That allowance is already given over there. If you want to claim a further relaxation of 10%, then you have to convince this fellow, this person. Today it's Sujata, tomorrow it may be someone else, that you need 10% relaxation, more relaxation. And now you say that I was crazy. For crazy, you have given 25% time. For three weeks, you have to be crazy. But if there is a student who had to undergo surgery, the student was unable to come to college, then that person will definitely be given a 10% uh, waiver. If there is some, some boy or some girl who has met with an unfortunate incident at home, loss of a parent, loss of a grandparent, and or, or any other matter, which, which definitely was a genuine reason, then you can claim this 10%. This 10% additional claim is only for those who have gone through some unwarranted situation. It could be illness, it could be any other sort of situation. You have already been allowed 25% time to take care of all minor issues. Pet kharaab ho gaya, loose motion ho gaya, khansi ho gaya, gala kharaab ho gaya, ye sab 25% time aapko diya ja chuka hai. 75% time aapko yaha aake padhna hai. Jo is university mein humne itni suvidhaay upalabd ki hai. Jiske liye is sanstha ka, is vishwadhyale ka ek ek admi din raat mehnat kar raha hai. जिस के लिए ये यूनिवर्सिटी एनएसयूटी जानी जाती है वो काम आपको करना पड़ेगा कारण ये है इट इज मैंडेटरी सो दैट यू डू नॉट फॉल इनटू एनी स्टेट ऑफ हेल्पलेसनेस डिप्रेशन ड्यूरिंग योर एग्जाम्स यू सडनली वैनिश फ्रॉम द क्लास you are sitting in your hostel rooms, you are joking, watching videos, etc. And you don't come to the class, but you have to take an exam. And just before the exam, you realize that I'm nowhere. You are taken aback. Ab mein kya karu? Mein counselor ke paas bhaagun ke mein nakal karu? Ye sab nahi karna hai. Aapko class mein aake pohna hai. That's all. Yes. For those who have actually gone through a rough patch, this fellow here, he or she, will make sure that you are given this allowance. And that is the maximum allowance. There is no allowance less than beyond that. And it doesn't fall under anyone's purview in this entire university to give an, a relaxation beyond this 10%. <clears throat> Further, Relaxation can be granted for a maximum of two times during the entire program. You claim it in first semester, you claim it in second semester, then you won't be able to claim it till final year. And the last point, now this is where I said I, I wouldn't have liked to say such things, but these points need to be absolutely clear to the students and the parents. You come and tell me that I was crazy, so I need 10% relaxation. Chahiye. Then I will definitely ask you that the 25% we have given you have done what you have done with it. You have eaten samosa with friends. You have eaten samosa with friends. You have eaten samosa with friends. That cannot be a valid reason. <coughs> so if you are not allowed to appear in the end semester examination due to shortage of attendance, you are awarded an FD grade. Now, if you fail, a student has to register for the same course again in the subsequent year. Register means that you will have to study the entire course afresh. It's not that you have to give an exam. You have to do all the class, all the evaluations, मिडसम दोबारा देना पड़ेगा एंडसम दोबारा देना पड़ेगा ये झंझट क्यों पालना है 
क्लासेस रेगुलरली पढ़ो थोड़ा थोड़ा पढ़ो पास एज सिंपल एज दैट students just understand one thing clearly if a student fails in a particular course then the student has to re-register for that course re-registration involves a re-registration fee of some six to seven thousand rupees per course number one Number two, you have to attend all classes and maintain the 75% attendance there. Again, you will have to take all the class tests. You will have to submit all the assignments. You will have to write the mid-semester exam again. You will have to write the end-semester exam again. And then according to the new class with which you had appeared in all these exams, you will be graded. So failing a course doesn't mean that you suddenly come and give only the end semester exam. No, the entire course has to be repeated. The logic behind this and the reason behind this is that more than 50% of the evaluation is based on continuous assessment. If a student fails a course, we say that the student has not understood the course. And since the assessment is around 50% based on, and when these backlog courses keep on accumulating, I have seen students in a lot of trouble. And unfortunately, we can't help them. All I have to, and again, I'm now appealing to the mothers. I said on the first day also, your role is not over. They, and they don't know where they are flying. Many of them don't know. Rather, most of them don't know. They suddenly realize when the first semester result is declared. What happened to us? We were the brightest in the whole of India. That is why we came to NSUT. What happened to our grades? We are getting C grade, we are getting D grade, we are getting F grade. And then you will curse the system. The system is not to be cursed. We told you at the right time. So parents, please keep a watch on your child. Education in NSUT is not that simple. They do need to put in their efforts. And if they are not opening their books regularly, if they are not opening their notebooks daily, then there is a issue. You should contact the university if you observe any such thing with your child. Because if a student gets an FD grade or an F grade, then the student has to repeat the entire course, which is a huge burden. Our fifth semester, we have to do course in the fifth semester. You have to do your placement. You have to do your gate. You have to do your cat. You have to do your work. You have to do your courses. So, I mean, Slow and steady wins the race. There is no problem at all. It's it's these things have been designed and the curriculum has been designed keeping the level of the student. You are very bright. You are very brilliant. Have confidence in yourself. But don't become overconfident and think that by aagaya bhiha, ab hum pass ho hi jayenge. Aisa nahi hai. NSUT mein to at least aisa bilkul nahi. To thoda thoda padhiye, rose padhiye. रेगुलरली पढ़िए इम्तिहान दीजिए अपना असाइनमेंट जमा कर दीजिए ऑनेस्टली पढ़िए ऑनेस्टली इम्तिहान दीजिए सब कुछ बिल्कुल परफेक्ट होगा जैसे आपने अपना जीवन प्लान किया इनमें से एक भी चीज आपने नहीं करी तो दिक्कत आपको होगी और आप कुछ नहीं करेंगे आप सिस्टम को क्रस करेंगे जिसका कोई लाभ नहीं सो नाउ लेट अस गो टू द नेक्स्ट स्लाइड दैट इज प्रमोशन एंड पासिंग अ कोर्स uh, do I have some time? Uh, okay, I'll be able to finish. So, the first clause is very important. This first point. This, there shall be no supplementary exam. All these things I have already explained, just explained to you. But this first clause is very important. It says that a student has to earn a minimum number motion to the next year means that 
if you if i go back to the slide if you look back uh, remember the uh, slide that i talked about some 10 15 minutes back first semester you are given 20 credits second semester you are given 24 credits so in one year you have 44 credits 44 credits roughly comes out to 11 courses so out of these 11 courses it is mandatory for you to pass around 50 percent to be promoted to the second year case a student shall not be promoted to the third semester if he she fails to earn at least 20 credits मतलब फर्स्ट सेमेस्टर और सेकंड सेमेस्टर दोनों को मिला के अगर आपके 20 क्रेडिट से कम हुए तो आप थर्ड सेमेस्टर में तब तक नहीं जा सकते तब तक आपके ये 20 क्रेडिट पूरे नहीं पेरेंट्स आप फर्स्ट सेमेस्टर के एंड में भी देखिए आपके बच्चों का क्रेडिट कार्ड क्या है सेकंड सेमेस्टर के भी एंड में देखिए क्रेडिट कार्ड क्या है we have seen and we have experienced that parents suddenly realize that oh their child is not in the semester in which he or she should have been and then you feel helpless and then again in this helplessness one does nothing but to curse the system don't do that keep an eye on the children after all they are still children they've just passed 12th so 